We're going to take a little <clears throat> diversion from the book of Acts this morning. I've got a little bit of a tie-in. We're going to look at the story of Gideon. <clears throat> and hopefully I've, I've, I've got enough of a tie-in that we can still tie a ribbon through it, through Acts, although it may be a little bit abstract. If we look at the books of history that we have in the Bible that we've defined as the books of history. There's 12 in the Old Testament and there's one in the New. That one in the New being Acts. And then uh, Joshua through Esther is books of history in the Old Testament. So we're going to look at Gideon from the book of Judges uh, this morning. And, and that history that we have in these books is what gives us the context from which we see God's people in the context of the church that we're members of. So I think it's important from that perspective that we always look at these books of history. Now, one of them is no more important than the other one. Certainly, I don't want to imply that, but we have them, as, as we have defined them, broken down into different sections. And those different sections have different purposes, and they speak to us in different ways at different times. And although I hated high school history and wasn't too fond of history when I was in college, I just didn't like getting up at 8 o'clock on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays and going to hear another dry lecture on American history and memorizing some more dates and times and people and treaties and all that kind of stuff. The further I get removed for it, the more I wish I had paid attention to it. Because it gives us that context, and in the case of American history, certainly it gives us that context of who we are as Americans. And there are several times that I wish that, or at least I feel, it's Richard's opinion, that perhaps those who are in leadership positions need to know more history. Maybe they didn't want to get up at 8 o'clock in the morning either and go to class when they were in college. Because we seem to be making a lot of the same mistakes over and over again, and history does that for us. It it gives us the lessons that we need in order to, to stay away from the mistakes that others have already made. And we look at certainly the church in the book of Acts and we see the history of our church, of God's church, of Jesus' church in that first century to see how it was established and what it went through then. And we've got the context of where we're trying to get back to. In the same, the same way in the Old Testament books of history, and we see the children of Israel as they went through their trials and tribulations, trying to occupy the promised land and going through the period of judges and kings and so on and so forth. And uh, we see the struggles that they did or, or went through and can learn certainly from that as well. Because we have that context of God's plan, which went you know, from God to a man, to a nation, back to a man, to a church, back to God. So we're going to look at and try to make some applications this morning um, through Gideon, looking at the story of Gideon. Judges chapter 6 is where we're going to spend a big part of our time. <clears throat> I'm going to bounce around a little bit, and I certainly have no problem with you looking at and reading Judges chapter 6 through about 8 as I'm talking and maybe paying more attention to God's Word than you're actually paying to me, because we're going to hit some highlights, and the story about Gideon is an incredibly interesting story, or at least it is to me, and hopefully I, I can uh, make it so to you. But when we first, we first look at Gideon, there in the sixth chapter of Judges, he is threshing wheat in a wine press to hide that, that threshing of that wheat from the Midianites. And he's doing that because the Midianites are just laying waste to everything that's, that belongs to the Israelites. They're tearing up the property, they're, they're raiding the crops, they're taking everything from them, they're just harassing them. How did we get to this point though? So I want to go back before we get here back to Gideon and go through a little bit of the background. First of all, do you know who the Midianites were or where they're from? Yes, no, maybe. 
I hear somebody mumbling. They're descendants of Abraham. Remember Abraham, after Sarah died, who did he marry? Keturah. One of the children was Midian. So there's a little bit of history there and a little bit of connection um, to the Midi- or to, from the, between the Midianites and the Israelites. The Midianites uh, had, had had an issue with the Israelites for hundreds of years before this. If you want to look back in Genesis chapter 25, <clears throat> Verse 1, Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. And she bore him somebody, 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 Midian, somebody, and somebody. Then somebody fathered somebody and somebody, and then the sons of somebody and so on and so forth. And the sons of Midian were, got the genealogy, names we all have trouble pronouncing and all that kind of stuff. Look at the next verse, though. Verse Five. We go through that little list. We see who Keturah was. We see who the children were. Nothing else. And then it says what? Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac. So we list off all the other kids. We forget them for just a minute. We go back to Isaac. That's who got everything. And then verse 6, But to the sons of his concubines Abraham gave gifts, and while he was still living he sent them all away from his son Isaac. Who was the heir? All right. Now there were more kids than just Isaac, right? There was another one that came before Isaac. Remember? Ishmael. But who got the goodies? Now, was this a part of the problem, perhaps? I don't really know. I just think it's interesting the way it's put. There's Abraham, there's Keturah, there's Midian. Isaac got the bulk of the will. And we go forward. And we know that there's problems between the, the, the two for years and years and years and years. Go up to Genesis chapter 37. <clears throat> What's the story that's in Genesis chapter 37? Joseph. What happened to Joseph? Pardon? His brothers didn't appreciate his attitude. So they decided they needed to do something with him. Was the plan originally to sell him? The plan was originally to kill him. But somewhere in a, you'll have to help me with the verse. I think it's 20 something. 28? Or or go back to 25 maybe. Because the brothers are sitting around and what did they look up and see? They see a group of Ishmaelites coming. The scripture says they see a group of Ishmaelites. Then in the same breath, the same scripture, or maybe the next one, it talks about those people came and it calls them Midianites. See that? We've got two men. And it continues to do that through the next three or four verses. Flipping back and forth between Ishmaelites and Midianites. Were Ishmaelites and Midianites the same thing? No. There's two different... Two separate groups of people, Ishmaelites from Ishmael, son of Abraham through Hagar, and Midianites, as we just looked at, son of Abraham through Keturah. The only conclusion I can draw is the two were traveling together. And we know from, from secular history that the Midianites were some of the first to domesticate camels and use them in their daily chores and their jobs and and these type of things. So Midianites and Ishmaelites and camels, and here they come. They're both nomadic, roving, kind of wild people. Apparently in this particular instance, they're working together. Because who was it that the scripture says just a couple of verses later sold Joseph to Potiphar? It says the Midianites did, right? All right, so another example of some of the offspring of Abraham who were dealing with the Israelites and not necessarily being their friend. Now, there's another very important side point here. And that is, regardless of who the people are that are involved, God's plan is going to be done. 
Period. One way or the other. God's going to use the Ishmaelites. God's going to use the Midianites. And He's going to see that His plan is done. And how many other examples of that do we have all through the Scripture? Is it not replete with that? I mean, it's everywhere. We see it constantly. So the Midianites that we've got in um, Judges chapter 6 are some of these. Now go to Numbers chapter 22. Remember the story about Balaam? Balak, the king of Moab, got worried about the Israelites. He saw them. They were too strong. They were an enemy. He was worried. It was something that he didn't want to have to deal with. He gets on the phone and calls the Midianites. They want to have a conference. They've got to do something about these Israelites. So the Moabites and the Midianites get together, have this little conference And Balak decides that he needs to call in a prophet to curse the Israelites. And he calls Balaam. Remember the story? He goes and he sends men to get Balaam. Balaam says, no, I can't go. No, you've got to come. No, I can't go. Yeah, you've got to come. And then God comes to Balaam in a dream and he says, look, if they just keep asking you and you think you have to go, just go. But you will not say anything against me. And so Balaam gets up and goes. It was kind of one of those things where, like we tell our kids, fine, just go, and then the kids go, and then we get mad at them because they actually did it when we know all along we didn't want them to go do it. And that's how he he treats Balaam. God treats Balaam. God's not happy with Balaam for actually going. But on the trip, Balaam and the donkey have a conversation. And then Balaam gets to Balak, And Balak says, I need you to curse the Israelites. And Balaam opens his mouth how many times? Three. It's got to be three, seven, ten, or forty. He opens his mouth three times. And what comes out of it? Blessings. And Balak gets extremely upset, doesn't want to deal with him, and so on and so forth. Later, though, in chapter 31, who dies? Could it be perhaps Balaam? And the scripture between where you are now in 22 or 25, give or take, um, is pretty clear that Balaam, even though he blessed the Israelites in this circumstance, also took Balak to the side and said, look, I had to bless them publicly, but I can give you a couple of secrets on how it's going to work that you can kind of reduce their effectiveness. And it had to do with their morality. Numbers chapter 25, verse 16. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Harass the Midianites and strike them down. For they have harassed you with their wiles with which they beguiled you in the matter of Peor, in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of the chief of Midian, their sister, who was killed on that day of the plague on account of Peor. And that's referring back to all that, those instances with uh, Balaam and Balak. So Moses is given instructions to strike them down. So we're talking about decades and hundreds and centuries and so on and so forth of activity going on here that, of which there are issues between the Israelites and the Midianites. Which brings us to the first point of the class this morning, and that is that God's plan, not our plan, or God's time, not our time. We think we understand, we think we know, we think we go forth and do, but we may not be on the right track. Back in the 90s, I went to uh, Belarus. It was terribly interesting. It was an experience I will never forget. Uh, We were preaching and teaching and holding Bible classes and all those kind of things, and the Russian people, or specifically the Belarusian people, were extremely receptive to us, nice and friendly. 
Um, and when faced with something that they just didn't know the answer to, they would just shrug their shoulders and say, God knows. Which I thought was really curious when I first heard it from a country that for 70 years was officially uh, atheistic. You know, the government had, had told its citizens there is no God. But yet uh, those people still had faith. And they would just shrug their shoulders and say, God knows. Kind of in the form of a question. God does know. And sometimes we don't. And so my question to you, I guess, would be how much stress and anxiety do we place on our own shoulders because we decide how much better we know than God how to accomplish things. I think there's an important lesson there um, about recognizing that God is God and we are not. All right. If you were going to make a battle plan, let's get back to Gideon. Now we've got a little bit of the history, a little bit of the background. If you were going to make a battle plan to go up against the Midianites and back to Judges chapter 6, look in those first three or four verses and tell me how many Midianites were there. They're described. They were as locusts. And how many camels did they have? The camels without number, and then there's another description next to that. If it's not there in the first, maybe it's later. Those camels were described as without number and as the sands by the seashore. Have we heard that terminology before? Bunch of camels, right? Bunch of people. All these Midianites and... And I think there was another group there with them, although it's escaping me right this minute. They were harassing the Israelites, although primarily we're talking about the Midianites. So this is who that Gideon is hiding from when we first encounter him early on in chapter 6. He's in a wine press. And I get the feeling that it's... I don't really know that uh, a wine press of that particular time, but from a little bit of research I did, it seemed to be something that was elevated first and encased. And so my, you know, the picture that comes up into my man, uh, mind is a big wooden barrel or vat, and people are walking around inside tromping on the grapes. Now, obviously, I don't have a clue if that's right or not, but it was something that Gideon could hide himself from everyone else because. He was up there trying to make enough wheat or grain in order to make some bread and he had to hide it from the Midianites because if they saw it, they'd take it from him. And what happened to him at that point? He's doing that. Who comes to see him? An angel of the Lord comes to see him. He's there at his father's house and the angel of the Lord appears under the terebinth tree and talks to him. What, is, what does the angel say to Gideon? Pardon? Did Gideon necessarily believe that the Lord was with him? Verse 8. The Lord sent a prophet to the people of Israel, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I led you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of slavery... And I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians, from the hand of all who oppressed you, and I drove them out before before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. What had Gideon done up to this point in his life in order to uh, earn that title, mighty man of valor? Pardon? (laughs) He was still alive? (laughs) Yeah.
We certainly know of nothing he's done. He was certainly a younger person and not someone, I guess you would think, that had had the opportunity to rise up through the ranks of the military and do anything that would earn him that title, but yet that's how God saw him. God recognized in Gideon something special and knew that Gideon was in the process or was about to lead his people out of the hands of the Midianites. As we look through these periods of judges, what do we see from one judge to the next judge to the next judge? Chapter 5 of Judges had been about Deborah. Was there peace and prosperity during the time of Deborah? Yes, there was. Forty years worth. What happened after Deborah died? The Israelites whored after the gods of the people whose, whose land they were. What did that lead to? In this particular case, seven years of, of hard labor at the hands of the Midianites. What, do you, what would be your first impression or your first response to someone who called you, you mighty man of valor, you're about to lead your people out of the hands of the Midianites? Would you believe that? Would you understand what was in store? Would you be chomping at the bit and ready to go? No. I don't know. Maybe some of all of them. What's Gideon's response? Me? I'm the least of my tribe, and my tribe's a small tribe. I'm from the tribe of Manasseh. We're pretty insignificant, and I'm the most insignificant within my family. Sound familiar? To others, perhaps when God has challenged them, their response has been, are you sure you've got the right guy? Dirk uh, points out that Gideon starts making excuses that it's the Lord's fault <laughs> that they're in this particular mess when in fact it's the Israelites' fault that they're in this particular mess. And so Gideon looks at the angel and he says, look, you know, I, <clears throat> we've never really met before. I don't really know you from Adam. Uh, do you have some credentials? I need a little bit more here. I'm going to go prepare some food and I'll be back. Will you stay? And he does. He says, yes, I will. And Gideon goes off, gets a goat. And can we chase a rabbit for just a minute? This is just one of my little things. You know all these scriptures we read about the angels coming or people coming and then the host saying, let me go get some food? They didn't go to the microwave and pop in something, some pizza pockets for them to have. He went and prepared a goat, which means he had to kill it, skin it, get the meat, cook the meat, and all that kind of stuff. It took some time. And so he's sitting, the angel sitting there patiently waiting for the meal to be prepared. There's something to be said there. There's a lesson there. Patience. And it's something that we don't do very well anymore because of the invention of the microwave and Burger King promised that we could have it our way. And those things are counter a lot of times to God's plan. But he gets the food and brings it back. And he puts it up, and the angel says, put it on the rock. And, and he brings some broth back. And the angel says, pour the broth on the top of the food. And he does. And then what does the angel do? <clears throat> Burns it up. <clears throat> Fire comes up out of the rock and consumes that which he just put there. And he recognizes that, recognizes that he's in the presence of someone special, an angel of God. And what's his first task? It's not go defeat the, enemy, uh, the Midianites. What's his first task? He's got to tear down an altar to Baal and an Asherah pole. Who did the altar belong to, by the way? His dad. So he's given a task of going and tearing down an altar to a false god and an Asherah pole that's next to it. You know what an Asherah pole is? Think of totem pole for now, for just purposes of what we're doing. False gods, another just memorial or statue, false gods. On top of everything else, the, the town people or the, er, the people that come to that particular altar to worship are going to be mad. It belongs to his dad. 
Not only is he told to tear it down, but he's told to take one bull to pull the altar down, another bull to cut up and put on the altar and offer a sacrifice on an altar you're going to build to replace the Baal altar and use the wood from the Asherah pole to burn up the bull. That's a pretty big job, don't you think? And a pretty scary job. What does Gideon decide to do with it? He's going to do it at night. He's going to do it, but he's going to kind of hedge his bet a little bit and take care of it in the dark. And he does. Gets it all taken care of. And the next morning, the predictable thing happens. What do the people do when they find the altar to Baal cut down or torn down, the Asherah pole cut down, and they find another altar built with a bull on it being offered up to a different God. They go to Joash. They want Gideon. Now, put yourself in Joash's spot. What would you do? It's your, it's your Baal altar. Shouldn't have been there in the first place, but it is yours. And they're coming after your son. Joash, to his credit, says, you know, you people need to get a life because if this is a Baal problem, Baal can deal with it, but you're not touching my son. And that's the right response here. He put it up there and he shouldn't have, but he recognizes what the issue, he knows that that altar is an altar to a false god. And because of that event, um, verse, hang on a second, um, 34, but the Spirit of the Lord clothed Gideon, and he sounded the trumpet, and the Abizrites were called out to follow him, and he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they too were called out to follow him, and he sent messengers to Asher and Zebulun and Naphtali, and they went up to meet them. What happened because Gideon did the will of God, and he did so boldly? They recognized that he was a leader, and they followed him, and they will continue to follow him. Point number two, we all respond to leadership, true leadership. We need to, we need to, to litmus test those that would be our leaders, certainly. And he had one right here. He did the will of God, and it was easily recognized by the people that he was doing such, and they responded to him. Now, the big thing's coming up, and that's the big fight, the big battle. And still Gideon was a little bit uh, nervous, I guess, and certainly God recognized it, because what did Gideon ask for next? We had another sign or test we had to do, right? There was a fleece, and I cannot tell you how many times I've read, I read this scripture in my lifetime, plus yesterday, and I stand before you now, and I cannot remember if the fleece was dry or wet on the first attempt. But you know what the story was. There's two attempts. One time the fleece was wet and the ground was dry. The next time the fleece was dry and the ground was wet. Is Gideon to be faulted for still having a little bit of trepidation? Do we have a little bit of trepidation a lot of times about things? Do we need a little more assurance sometimes? How do we get it? Prayer? The Scripture? Are we expected to be rock hard, top of our game, with above reproach at all times without assistance from God? He's there for us, right? He's our Father. He wants us to come to Him. And I, someone here recently, I can't remember who it was, talked about Thomas, doubting Thomas, getting a bad rap. 
uh, I can't remember who it was, that, but I think it was here, somebody in the pulpit used that remark, and I, I, I lashed on to it because I've always kind of felt the same thing. True, certainly, blessed are those who did not need to see the nail holes, but Thomas asked. I'm not sure that it was that much of a problem that he asked. Jesus showed him the nail holes. Gideon is asking again. God, I just want to make sure you're with me. Show me this. And God did. Furthermore, he's going to show him one more time. But I want to address how many people now, as we're getting ready to go to battle with the Midianites, did Gideon start out with? 32,000 people. What was the first question that Gideon asked of these 32,000 people? If you're afraid, raise your hand. How many people raised their hand? All right. Two-thirds of the army. Now, first of all, if you had 32,000 people, and you knew that your enemy was as locust and their camels were countless as the sands by the seashore, would 32,000 people seem like enough? It's a big crowd, but I cannot help but think that as big as that crowd is, it wasn't big enough. And 22,000 people said, you know what? This is really not what I'm wanting to do. That left him with 10. The next test, and the next test I think has such a great lesson because you've got 10,000 people there and those 10,000 people have said, we're not scared. We're going to go do it. We got your back, Gideon. We want to go fight. They're not afraid. If you were going to weed some more out of there, you might think that you would go about it like the, sea, the Navy does for the SEALs. They put them through weeks and weeks of mental and physical stress, and those people drop themselves out because they cannot deal with it. It's the most difficult indoctrination in military, what they do to a Navy SEAL. Is that what God did to those 10,000? How much does it tell us about our ability to fight as to how we drink water? Is there any relationship? Is there any connection between of those 10,000 people as to whether or not they're going to be good with a bayonet or a sword or a gun and drinking water? And 10,000 went on... 10,000 of them went down to the lake. 300 of them drank their water in a manner in which God said was the ones that he wanted. Some lapped it like a dog and some cupped their hands. And when it was all said and done, we chose 300. 300. We had 32,000, we cut it down to 10,000, and now we've lost another 9,700 to get down to 300. Dirk, were you raising your hand? I was going to say it makes a difference to God because if I remember correctly, the one who brought the water up to the mouth that God chose, which shows in my mind, in my opinion, more of an alertness, even of keeping an eye and keeping watch that you are on the battle and even though you just need to exaggerate that stuff. There is a difference in God's direction. Um. Dirk talks about a difference between of how they did it because some would have their, their heads down and some would have their heads up and be more alert. And I, I'm not going to argue that. And I did think that. I agreed completely with that for the longest time. And I've, I've recently kind of gone away from that because the point to Gideon was, Gideon, it doesn't matter which guy you've got. I'm going to win the battle for you. 
Because what are the words that, Gideon, that God gave to Gideon when he started this winnowing out process? Go back up a little bit in the chapter. And he says very clearly, nope, too many people, because the Israelites will think it was them that did this if I keep this many people here. What about the plagues and Moses and leaving Egypt? Who were the plagues for? Were they for the Egyptians? Yes, but who else were they for? What did the Israelites know of Moses when he came back to lead them out of Egypt? He was an 80-year-old guy they hadn't seen in 40 years. Were they ready to go? No. There had to be some lessons taught. In the same way there's lessons being taught here. Uh, Fran? Absolutely. Ooh, Dirk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call bail on you. I got two points I got to make. Verse 16. Pardon? Verse 16. Verse 16. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what happens next is that God gave him one more opportunity to understand what his plan was. And he sent him down to the camp. He said, if you're still worried about this, go down to the camp. Because take your servant with you and just sneak in there and listen to what they're doing. And he went down to the Midianites' camp and he overheard a conversation between two Midianite soldiers in, one, in which one of them was recounting a vision that he had to the other one. And he said, I saw a barley loaf roll down the mountain and smash the tent and turn the tent upside down. And the other um, soldier said, well, that can only mean one thing. That can, mean, that can only mean the sword of, Midian, uh, sword of Gideon is going to come and wipe us out. And when Gideon heard this, he knew. And the scripture says, uh, verse 15, As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. First thing he did, he worshipped. So point number three, God did, or Gideon did not question God. He worshiped and obeyed. And then, of course, the rest of it, he went down to the camp. He won the battle. He did it with a clay pot and a trumpet and a torch and didn't take a single weapon with him offensively. And then what happened when he did all the, the, the screaming and the yelling and the blowing of the trumpet and the breaking of the clay pots? the enemy turned on itself and wiped them, their own selves out and then ran away. Would you have figured that was the way this was going to go when the whole thing started? Doubtful. Now, point number four, look at uh, verse 32 of chapter 8. <clears throat> and Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash, his father. As soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned again and whored after the Baals, and the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God who had delivered them from the hand of their enemies on every side. Mm. You think they would learn. Point number four, as long as we are God-centered, we have peace. God will never leave us. We, on the other hand, have a tendency to think we can make everything happen on our own. All right, last scripture in order to finish this. Okay, Turn with me to Habakkuk. How many of you read Habakkuk on a, on a regular basis? I have read it, but this week I got in one of those daily devotionals kind of things a, a scripture that, I, that fit this class and I want to end with. And furthermore, I want to challenge you to memorize it and write, or write it on a piece of paper and keep it on your desk in front of you and read it about every five minutes. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 17. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength, and He makes my feet like the deer. He makes me tread in high places. 
enough said as far as I'm concerned. Chuck? The shorter version is 2-4. 2-4? Okay. All right. Question? Pardon? Habakkuk 3.17. Habakkuk 3.17 through 3.19. And Chuck said a shorter version is chapter 2, verse 4. You want to go for the Cliff Notes version, the, the abridged <laughs> version. All right. Uh, second bell is about like 10 seconds away. Okay, we're good. <laughs>